Oh, hello, and welcome to Office Hours, the live part of the facility where good old Professor Kyle opens up his digitally enabled doors and lets all the members of the facility and the general public who saw a red flashing light above a very obscure door and decided to wander in like they were making a bad decision in an action movie. <gasps> and we go through all the topics that I found interesting, fascinating, educational, funny, weird, hey, huh, wow, for this week. And we also take all of your comments, questions, and descriptions of my hair. If you want to join the facility right at the top of the show and just continue this discussion after this show is over, which will be about an hour, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill as, as my security team is putting in the chat right now. And as a side note, my security team is in the chat from the facility and they have wrenches and buckets. How they use them is up to you. And of course, if you really, really want me to see a message, you can simp for science by using the super chat on YouTube. I'll do my very best uh, to get to all of those. And as an example, look at DGP Chico with the $200 donation going towards the science simping. Eh, it's better than Belle Delphine. Eh, depend. Let's not, we don't have to judge it. She makes $30,000 a week. Hey, Kyle, Kyle the Kyle. I don't have any questions, I'm just here to meme, and hashtag simp for science, this is also the first live stream I've made, so I'm pretty stoked for that, not gonna lie. Well, Chico, this next part of the stream is all for you. What part of the stream am I talking about? Well, Chico, I took your simping for science, and I came up with a number of topics we're gonna be going through today off the very top of my head. We're gonna be talking about the quantum internet, and that might take a little while because NGL, Chico. It is pretty confusing, just like quantum mechanics as a whole. Then we will be talking about the longest organism ever yet discovered, if you can call it an organism. Mm, we'll get to that. We'll also be talking about another study on video games and violence. You can guess what it says if you know who I am. We'll also be taking another one of your comments from the latest episode of The Facility, which is another story time with Kyle about the elephant's... Uh, I was trying to think of the word of foot in Spanish, but I forgot about it. And then finally, we'll be talking about a new behavior, according to science, that you should be uh, engaging with your cat on. That's one of my cats. But before we get to all that, I'm getting to your comments just a bit. You know what? Now, nah, before we do super chats and everything, let's jump right into the quantum internet because... It does get confusing, and I want to go through it with all of you who just tuned in for this first topic, and then it, they're going to jump out. Hey! So, the quantum internet. What do I mean when I say that? Well, this is coming off a paper that many of you have sent to me over the course of the last week. Um, it was a paper published in PRX Quantum, and a team uh, using very complicated quantum equipment and also off-the-shelf optical equipment like fiber optic cables and mirrors and lasers were able to demonstrate for the first time a sustained long distance, 44 kilometers, teleportation of qubits of photons with fidelity greater than 90%. Qubits were teleported over a fiber optic network using state-of-the-art single photon detectors and off-the-shelf equipment. Kyle, what does that mean? Well, don't worry, baby birds. Right when I get back to the chat, wherever it is, I'll feed you. So what does this mean? Well, this experimental setup could fit on your tabletop or your facility tabletop, uh, and it looks something like this. It's not super complicated. This wasn't, um, you know, two stations on the other side of the world. This was just a lot of fiber optic cables, lasers, and mirrors. Now, what makes potentially quantum computing and using quantum mechanics in our technology so um, alluring? is that quantum mechanics has a weird, very weird, and non-classic, non-intuitive property called superposition. That means a quantum system, let's say a photon, can exist in more than one state at the exact same time before it is measured. This is superposition. So if you wanted to make this analogous to something like a computer, Computer can have a one or a zero, and using a sequence of ones and zeros, you can make some sort of code, right? Well, with a, that, that would be a bit, a one or a zero. With a quantum bit, or what we will be referring to as a qubit, it can be in the superposition of a one and a zero at the exact same time, okay? 
So if you have a one and a zero at the exact same time, that means you can code for all at once a lot more information, even though you don't know what it is yet. So for example, if you wanted to know just how much information you could get out of a system of qubits in a theoretical quantum computer, because it can exist in two states at the exact same time, a one or a zero, the number, the, the amount of information you could code in a system of interconnected qubits would be two to the power of n where two is uh, two, uh, and to the power of n, n being the number of qubits. Because remember, it's existing in two states at the exact same time. So the more you have, it's um, raising itself to a power based on the number of qubits. So a traditional computer, you know, how much information can it hold? You know, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes. If, and this is my TI-89 titanium calculator, of course. So let's say that we had a quantum computer with just 300 qubits. That's not even one kilobit or one kilocubit. It's not even a thousand, just 300 qubits. That is two to the power of 300. And if we enter two to the power of 300, it is more than the number of atoms in the observable universe. So you can see, even with a very, quote unquote, basic quantum computer, you could code for more information than atoms in the universe. So what you can do with this kind of computing power, theoretically, is work through problems that only supercomputers can tackle in a fraction of a time, where um, there's some theoretical, well, there's some quantum computers that Google is working on that can power its way through a problem that would take a supercomputer 10,000 years in just a few seconds or a few minutes. So you can see the transition to quantum computers would uh, result in a quantum leap <laughs> in terms of processing power. Now we get to the quantum internet. Now what you may be thinking the quantum, the quantum internet is, which is what I thought, you might be thinking that this is some way to get around distance limitation. You've probably heard of spooky action at a distance. This is what Einstein called it, where if you have a entangled quantum state, say you have an entangled pair of photons, you measure one instantaneously, faster than the speed of light, regardless of distance, the other entangled photon, for example, will be in another state. It will collapse the, the entanglement, so to speak, and if you measure one state, the other photon that's entangled is instantaneously another state, or it instantaneously collapses into whatever random variable it could be. Now, this is faster than light. If I took um, entangled photons to the edge of the universe and I measured one here, the one at the other end of the universe would travel faster than light and instantaneously change. But there's no free lunch in the universe. And if you could do that with information, say I could send information via qubits to you on the other end of the, uni end, end of the universe simultaneous, uh, instantaneously, bah, it's live. That would be faster than light and it would literally violate causality. And violating causality is a big no-no in the universe. So as the math bears out, and as you can prove, um, there is a no, quote unquote, a no communication theorem in quantum mechanics that says you cannot transmit information in this entangled way. An entangled photon can't transmit some kind of um, understandable information to the other one faster than light. Okay, so well, how then does a quantum internet work if it's not using entanglement to tra uh, transmit information? Well, it kind of is. So... Here's a, di a very simple diagram of what this paper is talking about. So you would entangle a pair of photons in a quantum system. You would relate them to each other quantum mechanically so that what happens to one will instantaneously happen to the other. This is a qubit. So you, you take a qubit of information. Let's say we, we fire a, a blue laser at a beam splitter, which is what they're doing, and we split these single photons of red light into two separate lower energy, uh, or two separate, fo oh, sorry, this photon of blue light, and we separate it into two entangled photons of red light at a lower energy. 
Now these two photons are entangled. They are qubits of information themselves. Because, because remember, these, these photons can exist in more than one state at the exact same time. Now what the quantum inter internet is doing, it is trying to transmit a qubit of information to a distant source through regular channels. Okay, so there's a difference here. We're not collapsing one qubit to make a one and a zero appear faster than light. No, we're taking one qubit and we want to send the quantum system as an entangled quantum system somewhere else so that a quantum computer could use that qubit. So let's be very clear about this. There's no faster than light communication going on. Rather, the advance here is being able to transmit qubits themselves, like you can transmit binary data. And they're doing this with fiber optic cable stuff we already have. That's very important. So if you can transmit qubits across space and time through normal measures, like a fiber optic cable at the speed of light, then quantum computers connected all over the world can communicate quantum mechanically. This would be the quantum internet. So interconnected, hyper-fast quantum computers. How do you do that? Well, there's a problem is that quantum states or quantum entangled states are very fragile. And so any um, degradation of them will collapse the qubit and everything will pop out of existence and it won't work. So traditionally, with fiber optic cables sending you, you know, Netflix movies that you're watching on the couch with your significant other, um, you can use uh, amplifiers along the line of the fiber optic cable to boost the signal and counteract any losses. You can't do that with a qubit because once you start messing around with the qubit, it pops out of existence and the entanglement collapses. So what is hap So what they do here, what they had to come up with is what's called quantum repeaters at many stages of the system. And more or less what a quantum repeater is doing is what they call in quantum networks entanglement swapping. So using something like a stand-in entanglement system to entangle here and then entangle there. And then as this process goes down the chain, you're daisy chaining together entanglement swapping where you, you entangle it once and then you untangle it, so to speak. And then the resultant is that this circle, this blue circle, Alice is entangled with Bob because it's being connected at each point. And why they're doing that is because a signal right now can only travel so far before it degrades. So it kind of has to be re-entangled. Like and so far, they're getting to about 44 kilometers. That's really cool. So you can imagine the quantum internet as a series of interconnected fiber optic cables with quantum repeaters going down them that would be able to transmit qubits of information from one place to another, and quantum computers could use those qubits in place. Well, what could we use this for? Well, like I said, quantum computers can be insanely fast, um, but one potential application is that it would make any message that you wanted to send um, encrypted impossible to break. Now, remember what I said that these entangled systems are very sensitive to measurement. In fact, if you try to measure it, it pops out of existence, right? So if you try, so say we're sending this qubit from Alice to Bob and Alice is saying, look, I want to Netflix and chill, but don't tell my roommate that we're going to be using her account. You want that to be encrypted. Well, if her roommate is a, is a sweet hacker with a hoodie in a dark, dimly lit place, if her roommate tries to, quote unquote, listen in and decrypt this message al somewhere along the chain, this will be literally measuring the system. You have to observe the system. And then it pops out of existence. And once it pops out of existence, Alice and Bob immediately know someone's been listening in because it changes the signal. And so you could try to send these messages until you can be sure that no measurement in between was made. And so you could have completely secure encrypted communications about Netflix and chilling. So the takeaway here is the quantum internet is promising to connect quantum computers, quantum systems using traditional 
speed of light, fiber optic cables, and stuff like that. It's not crazy, faster than light, Ender's Game style, you know, Star Wars style communication where you can communicate across fast distances that wouldn't be allowed by causality. Instead, it is using existing systems to try to harness the power of quantum mechanics and superposition in a in distributed networks. It's like distributing entanglement such that you can have an internet of quantum. And I think that's pretty dang cool. <laughs> Let's see what you have to say about it. Vid Judge here with the $75 donation who says, Simping for Science, hi Kyle, frontline healthcare worker here, awesome show as always. I wanted to ask if you have any opinions on the K-Star fusion reactor and their attempts to make fusion power a reality. The problem right now, and thank you for being on the front lines, thank you for putting your body, your health, and your psyche on the line to get this pandemic under control, first and foremost, uh, but second most, yeah, the problem right now is that fusion reactors haven't been able to get more information, uh, more, sorry, I'm still on the quantum internet thing, more uh, energy out than has been put into them. So there's a lot of cool fusion research going on. I've seen some of it firsthand. Um, if you want to watch my largest laser in the world fallout video on another channel, I can't remember its name. Um, I checked out the largest laser in the world and they're trying to do that. Um, but the advancements simply aren't here yet. Uh, what we need to embrace, e even though fusion power is very alluring, what we need to embrace in the short term is nuclear power itself. Um, the world needs more nuclear power and we need to be cooler about using nuclear power and for a whole video on that you can stay tuned for a whole video on that that i'll be doing thomas hadrick with a 100 dollar donation wow you guys are really coming in you guys missed office hours i like that hey kyle love the ps5 yeah i wish i could get one just reminding people that the term is qubit not a qbert any definitely not super villainy plans for 2001 well thomas since people are liking the story time with Kyle, my quote-unquote Half-Life Histories series so much, we will be doing, I hope to do those about once a month uh, for as long as I'm interested in them. And um, I'm really liking the format and I'm really liking how they're doing. So uh, this month there's going to be another one, a brand new essay, essay that I wrote, like 4,000 words about another nuclear disaster you may not know about. And I hope everyone enjoys that. Mixmaster114 with the 20. Hey, Kyle Senpai. Konnichiwa. Uh, I love learning and listening to your educational videos like yours while at work. What are some other good channels, podcasts you can recommend? Well, so my brain gets a little tired sometimes with all the science content because it's what I do for a living. So one uh, podcast that I could definitely recommend if you haven't listened to it and you like history is Hardcore History uh, with Dan Carlin. If you haven't heard it before, I, rec I recommend starting at the series Blueprint for Armageddon. Basically, he has like 10 hour segments of going through history in a hardcore like fashion, uh, super detailed, super interesting. I'd recommend that greatly. I, would, I also love listening to the Sam Harris Making Sense podcast. He has um, some very, very intelligent people on discussing very important things. It's where I learn a lot every day. Uh, those two podcasts is where I would start. In terms of science podcasts, I don't really listen to science podcasts because uh, I kind of do science all day, every day. And I, I, I like to have some sort of you got to round yourself out as a person. Alan Saladar with the Russian $50. Hey, Kyle. Oh, you're from Brazil. Hey, Kyle. Definitely not a supervillain. Lots of love from Brazil. Nice to finally catch you live. Would, would quantum entanglement be a good solution for the Jupiter brain problem of communicating with itself since it's so big? So you're describing a computer that is uh, an entire planet's worth of computing power. Yet yeah, it's, it's limited by speed of light communication, but I don't know still across a planet, I mean, you can get from the Earth to the Moon in less than a second at the speed of light. So I, I still don't know if it's the real limiting factor. I would have to look more into it. Elizabeth Calvert and her tiny one with a $50 donation. Everybody coming in strong as office hours are back. We have a $15 donation. Once it loads up, oh, you guys are being far too generous today. We got to get to our second topic. You got you to gotta stop. Brandon Carson, 15, says, Hey, Kyle, my daughter, Rhiannon, cool name, S. why do grapes in a microwave create plasma? Uh, okay, so I would suggest going to my adoptive father, Veritasium's channel, type in Veritasium grape plasma, and you'll find he did a whole video on this, which is very educational. Um, but more or less, if I'm remembering correctly, 
um, the the width of two halves of a grape um, is almost exactly the same um, size as the wavelength of the microwaves being used. And so at the center of the, at right at the, 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 the point where the two grapes touch, it's creating some sort of node of constructive interference where it's superheating the air and creating plasma. I believe that's what's going on. Um, the grapes are the same size as the wavelength, and that's just happenstance, right? Um, so I believe that's what's going on. Uh, we have Tam, one of my esteemed professors with the 50, says, are you saying that with processing power of quantum computer beaming is more of quantum computer beaming is more feasible. One of the problems is the transport of information, the state of all humans from a, all atoms from a human body. Yeah, so when you're thinking of teleporting a human, this is different. This, quantum teleportation in this way is, again, you're running into the no communication problem. If you traditionally, like a Star Trek style teleporter, you would take you would, catalog, you would catalog all the information in the human body, every single position, energy, state of every atom, every electron in the human body. You would translate that into data, send it somewhere else, and reconstitute, reconstitute you on the other side after destroying your original body. A, it's too much information for anything we have right now. And B, um, again you can't translate this into information that can instantaneously beam you somewhere else because of the no communication theorem. Um, you could do calculations more quickly, but it would still have to be sent somewhere else. If you translate it into qubits somehow, you'd still have to send those qubits somewhere else at traditional speeds. Robert Allison with the $150 donation. Sim for Science, been real and active in the Discord because of work, but you're awesome. I love the hair and all hail the basilisk. Also, all hail the foot and all hail the demon. You didn't say that, but I said that. Uh, let's pause the Super Chats for a second so we get to the next uh, topic on our list here, and I don't have to be so tiny on your television or screen. Kyle, designing a Pokemon region. Order of Anima with a 10. If you could make a Pokemon, what's your concept? Would love to include it in the show. Oh, lo love to include it to show it. Love from Wisconsin. Go Pack Go, Aaron Rodgers, MVP. Um, my, I've never, I've never thought of what design my own Pokemon would be, believe it or not. Um, hmm. Oh, Cuttlefish. I want a flamboyant Cuttlefish um, Pokemon. Look it up, flamboyant Cuttlefish. Um, and uh, it has a sand attack-like attack that uh, uses ink. It has a, a tentacle whip attack. Um, two tentacles shoot out with Cuttlefish, and they grab stuff. Um, and then it can also change color, so it's going to have a reflect-like ability that gives it super high um, either special defense or confuses the enemy because sometimes flamboyant cuttlefish will change one the side of their body that's facing dudes to look like a, a, a lady and the side that's facing a lady to look like a dude. So it's like confusing everybody. Like, don't worry about me. I'm not trying anything. But in fact, they are. So let's pause the Super Chats for a second. Chip Tech with the 10. It says, hey, Kyle, just want to show my love for what you do, but also curious as to your opinions about cybernetics using tech to enable enhance those without do we have tech to do that or not well one cybernetic that's probably the most widely used i don't know uh probably the most impressive to me is the cochlear implant where you can take auditory sig where you can take pressure waves transduce them into electrical signals and then put them directly onto your brain and get some semblance of sound the fact that humans know enough to do that blows my mind and i love it so with that let's get to the next topic which is the longest organism so when we talk about the longest organism you're probably thinking of something like a blue whale if you want to be even more um fishy with it <laughs> you could talk about um organisms that are colonies like trees and their interconnected root systems or fungi under the ground but in terms of an organism that still looks like uh, an animal, this is an animal. This animal is called a siphonophore, one of my favorite kinds of animals ever. And using the diameter of this doom spiral, as, the, as uh, people have been calling it, this animal looks to be, what? Over 100 meters long, 140 
meters long, uh, 120 meters long. So 120 meters long is longer than a football field, and it's one organism. Or is it? Siphonophores are absolutely incredible because they are not one, but many. Siphonophores are called uh, colonial organisms in that many tiny animals come together to form one megazord of an animal, if you will. So if you were to look closer at this doom spiral, you would see, and these are examples, these aren't the exact animals here, but you would see many different little, what they're called, zooids, these tiny animals that make up a larger uh, Voltron of an animal, if you will. And like the cells in your body, each one of these animals, it's like taking micro to macro scale, each one of these animals takes on a specific function inside the mechazoid. So some of these zooids are specialized to move. Some of these um, are specialized with, as you can see in the middle here, G, stinging barbs. And yet others still of these zooids are meant to be the stand-in for the digestive tract. So what I mean when I say this is literally... This is like a singular exoskeleton that is created jointly by all these animals. But along this line, there are different zooids doing different things as one collective. It's, a, it's as though an entire ant colony was physically connected. So in a jellyfish-like way, when animals and, and plankton and other things swim into these nets of nematocysts, poison hypodermic spring-loaded barbs, they are captured, they're paralyzed, and then they're, di then they're, by another zooid, they're digested. And then what other zooids do inside of this colony is take that digested food and spread it throughout the rest of the colony. Like, it's animals acting as a large intestine. Now, if siphonophores weren't amazing enough, which I think they are, like, think... You, you, you're familiar with many cells becoming an organism, but what about many organisms? Many, uh, excuse me. But what about many organisms becoming a mega organism? So cool. But what's even cooler about this is that m most, uh, most siphonophores that you will see are like, you could measure them with your arm length. This is, <laughs> you know. 400 feet long or something, eh, 360 or so feet long. And what it's doing is a specific behavior, right? This spiral, if you think about it, might not be random. Because if you were just a long animal, you could just be long. That is to say, you could just be a long straight line in the ocean, like a curtain hanging down. But... If you think about it, what would be the most efficient way to capture some amount of prey in some volume or some surface area? One of the solutions that evolution has hit on with these zooids, it appears, is to create a literal galaxy of tentacles to capture more prey in a volume than it otherwise would if it was perfectly straight. So. As scientists uh, like Rebecca Helm on Twitter have been pointing out, what is amazing is that we are seeing in a, in a mega animal a hunting behavior that we've never seen before. And because this is so deep in the ocean, and because deep in the ocean it is so cold, it's like three degrees above freezing, um, Rebecca suggests that when you're in cold water or cold environment, organisms tend to grow more slowly. And so this particular siphonophore, she says, is likely tens, possibly hundreds of years old. And if you go down uh, further on in her thread about this, she says, you know, not only is this possibly hundreds of years old, but the ocean is so vast that, quote, there are probably millions or maybe billions of underwater siphonophore galaxies out there just like this one. 
Siphonophores are not rare, they're just fragile and remote. As we explore the oceans more, who knows what other creatures we will see. And uh, before I forget here, I want to show you... This is, a, this is a frame. So I want to show you the full video. Look at the size and the vastness of this. Again, if this were random, we wouldn't expect some kind of specific shape. This is very purposefully a spiral. And you could theorize it as some kind of hunting behavior. But I think it is absolutely incredible and the longest organism, colonial organism, at least, that we've ever seen. Duality with the 20 says, You are awesome and inspiring, and, I really, and I'm really proud to see how many people there are here. Well, you, you speak for me as well, brother. Uh, Orealis with the 10 says, Say hi, Riley. Hi, Riley. I was told to say that against my will. You don't have to include that in whatever video message you send. Wait, is this cameo now? No, I'm not that... desperate. Heralis with the Australian $5 says, Show the love, Kyle. Hey, nuclear is a power source we don't need. Democratize the power of the grid and install solar energy on any every roof. I will disagree with you, and I will disagree with you in a in a video to come out maybe this month, maybe a little bit later, but um, we do absolutely need nuclear power. If for nothing else, then wind and solar are clean and very good, but in terms of being a, uh, the amount of energy it can produce for the amount of carbon it can save going into the atmosphere, uh, nuclear energy is far and away many times more efficient and as clean, as neutral. If you don't believe me, and there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of tension, a lot of emotions around a nuclear power, we will go through it all um, in a video coming soon, I promise you. Bernie with the Australian $5. Hey Kyle, in Star, Star Trek Discovery, they say that a person is transformed into a unique energy system they transport across the intervening space. Well, a unique energy system is just kind of like, well, Canonically, they create a pattern, and I'm assuming that is just a, 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 a description of your information. So, they vaporize you at one end and reconstruct you on the other end. Um, and even if they're sending energy across space, it's, it can still only travel at the speed of light. So, you're still not getting around that FTL requirement, uh, or uh, stipulation. Synthetic Evil with the $20 saying, just started watching The Expanse, and I love it. How far do you think we are from that kind of reality? Hashtag simping for science. The Expanse is the best science fiction show of this generation. Um, it's the best science fiction show since Star Trek The Next Generation, and it is the most accurate sci-fi show ever. You can quote me on that. Um... How close are we to that? It is near future. I mean, being able to colonize other planets in the solar system without being able to go interstellar with current technology is not that far off. If we were to create some sort of fusion engines that allowed for very quick travel throughout the solar system, so it didn't take years to get to Jupiter or whatever, it, it only took a few weeks, then everything in the Expanse is rather plausible, as most of the stuff in the show is. The cool CG with the five says, Hey Kyle, as a meteorology major, using quantum computers could be huge for continuing to improve weather models, which aren't very accurate. Yeah, well, good luck on your studies in meteorology. Yeah, uh, the thing that people don't, I think, realize when they get all hoity-toity about, well, you know, climate models and climate change. Models for the climate, like you are using Cool GC, are some of the most complicated supercomputer needing models that humans have ever made. And so it is very, like, they are, how dare you? How dare you think it's so simplistic? It's like, well, what do the scientists know? These are some of the most complicated models if we're alone in the universe, in the universe. And quantum computing, a great step, step up theoretically from supercomputing would be a great boon to that sort of, um, Study. Wow. Kevin Rayo with the $50 donation says, Hey Kyle, thanks for being an awesome science interpreter. Yeah, I guess that's a better better title than what I've been using. Let's pause the Super Chats for a second so we can get on to our next topic. But few questions. Have you tried Impossible yet? 
Oh, the Impossible Burger. Would you ever consider doing an episode on lab-grown meat? With how inefficient they are, do you think we'll make room on the spaceships for cows? Um, I would. I have not tried an Impossible Burger yet. The last couple times I've tried to get one, they've been sold out, which I like. Um, would I consider doing a video on it? Absolutely. I really want to try it. Um, it seems like they're figuring out how to make it taste more like a burger, and that's going to be critical in getting uh, public acceptance of it. And I am of the opinion that... If something costs more, but does more for the environment, it's like a tax. It's like an environmental tax, if you think about it. You have to pay more to save some amount of carbon from going into the atmosphere, or some amount of methane from the flatulence of cows going into the atmosphere, and I think that is worth it. Some kind of climate tax in that way is absolutely worth a few extra dollars. That's my opinion. Uh, Jennifer Oliver with the 20 says, Please shout out my four boys who love your show. Xavian, Sebastian. Hey, Christoph, Xavian, Sebastian, and Atlas. Your mom is a pretty cool lady, and you better listen to her when she tells you to do your chores. You know why? Because this science guy says so. Also, hello. Goodbye. So, we are on to our third topic here, which is another study. And why am I... Why am I showing Grand Theft Auto? Well, the, the study is called Growing Up with Grand Theft Auto, a 10-year study of longitudinal growth, violent video game play in adolescence. So before we even get into it, what am I talking about? So a longitudinal study is a study that follows, or studies, <laughs> the same group of things and gets consistent measurements of the same variables across some amount of time. So the easiest example of, it, of, of this would be following a single population of people over time, say 10 years, and getting the same variables from them. So what this study was looking into was uh, looking at a group of adolescents, tracking them for 10 full years, and along that time, asking them, you know, uh, giving them scale, uh, questionnaires, psychologically verified, or social science verified um, questionnaires, which I, that's what I worked on in my master's program. In fact, I know how to construct those things. That's neither here nor there, neither here nor there. But they were giving them questionnaires asking their attitudes um, that would get towards, again, based on social science, general measures of aggression, uh, measures of violence, uh, the violence in the games that they are playing, their pro-social behaviors, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, if you've been paying attention at all in the media, the media uh, wants to demonize violent video games specifically for having some sort of negative impact on the youth. And while this is just, Chonku, get out of here. My, my cat's breaking in in the facility. Honey! Just a, just my cat is, son of a. Kevin, will you reinforce the doors? Chonko is very strong and very fat. What were we talking about? I'm frazzled now. Right. So uh, the media wants to, to demonize violent video games, and this could, of course, be linked to some sort of... Uh, yeah, everyone laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Laugh it up. Um, some sort of moral panic, as happens every few years, you know, some new thing. Oh, this new technology is ruining kids, or reading is making women promiscuous, or whatever the dummies used to say. That happens every so often, but there's also, I'm not going to show the cat. She's very fat. She wouldn't fit. She'd like knock stuff over. Um, <laughs> so there are, at least to this idea's credit, there are um, social science theories that theorize, a, a general aggression model, they call it, where the more you view violent media, 
the more aggressive thoughts and tendencies that you might have. And that's not that's not crazy, right? I mean, there there there's some sort there's some part of our psychology that makes that feel like it makes sense. Well, it may feel like it makes sense, but do experiments bear that out to be true? As Richard Feynman says, if your theory does not agree with experiment, your theory is wrong. So if we look, <laughs> uh, so if we look at what this study found, what they were looking at is basically how much violent video games people are uh, people people uh, people are engaging with over time, and how that tracks with prosocial behaviors and stuff like aggression. And so I will read. One of the conclusions in the study, 73% uh, of, in, of individuals studied in this longitudinal study were in the group of, quote unquote, um, low violent video game play, which means that they didn't play a whole lot of video games as they, uh, violent video games as they were growing up, but as they got older, they played more and more. Um, I, can, I can consider that I fell into this group. Many of you probably fall into this group where you grew up with like, Zelda and Mario, and then as you got older, um, you still play Zelda and Mario, of course, uh, but you might also be playing, you know, Doom Eternal and Call of Duty and these kind of things. It just comes with age, it seems like that, and that's, this is the vast majority of people in this group, less to more. Um, and so, quoting from the study now, this group showed the healthiest pattern of behavioral and mental health predictors and outcomes when compared with the other groups. This group was no higher in aggressive behavior than the initial violence group at the final time point. Oh, then the high violence group. So at the final time point, both the people who play the least amount of violent video games and the most amount of violent video games had the same levels of aggression. Selecting that low and slightly increasing levels of violent video game play may not be related to increased aggressive behavior over time. Huh. So this 10 year Longitudinal study suggests that even if you, if you play a little bit of violent video games, even if your violent video game play increases over time, the measures that we have for measuring aggression do not validate the hypothesis that viewing more violent media makes you more violent. Wow. Who would have thought? Do you know who would have thought? The person who has our common peer review this week. Peer review. So as I am wont to do every week, I look back on the previous week at the facility and I select a comment or question or correction that made me think or go, hey, hell well. And then I give them a plaque and then I make them an honorary member of the facility. This week, it's, co it's coming from Mostly Pennycat, who is talking about my episode on the elephant's foot. And if you want to watch this episode, I recommend it because I'm trying a new format and I think it's turning out cool. Um, mostly Pennycat says, there's a fascinating paper arguing that with the analysis of fission products involved in the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. The second explosion in reactor number four, the steam explosion that blew up all the core and spewed radioactive filth all over the countryside, could only have been created by a supercritical execution, a true nuclear explosion. The only reason it argues that it didn't create kilotons of explosive force was that it lacked carefully designed neutron reflectors. Um, and this is what we talked about in our first Half-Life history, where you can reflect neutrons back in on the core, the demon core, and it creates a criticality event. And moderators found in atomic bombs. When an A-bomb does this, it has to, it's, a, it's said to have fizzled, creating only tons of TNT of explosive force. So I didn't know this, and I, and I, I guess I just kind of fizzled in my research of this. But what ultimately killed or, or destroyed the heart of Chernobyl, it looks like it was a prompt criticality accident. So the main way in non-thermonuclear non weapons that you get a, a bomb to create a nuclear explosion is you compress a sphere. Well, you can also shoot. Anyway, let, let's just go with the easy model. You compress a sphere of nuclear material that's not critical into a volume so small that it goes critical. There's so many neutrons. The, the density of neutrons is such that it creates a chain reaction. That's one way to create an atomic blast. So what 
did actually happen in Chernobyl, apparently, I didn't know this, was that once uh, the core was failing, once water was vaporizing, um, and the first explosion happened, some of the fuel collapsed, like physically collapsed back in on itself in the meltdown. And when this happened, it got so close that it did sort of act like a small atomic bomb. It, it, uh, like uh, mostly Pennycat says, it, it wasn't a perfect atomic bomb because those are carefully designed and oriented in, in, with geometry in three-dimensional space. But it was enough to create a brief criticality accident that created the explosion that eventually coughed up material that, you know, contaminated 16,000 square kilometers of Russia and Europe. And I did not know that. So for pointing that out, mostly Penny Cat, you are now an honorary member of the facility. And if you DM me, you have to find it or email me. I will make you an honorary member of the facility for a full month. Nobody's done that yet. You could be the first. So, Gavin, why don't you get the plaque? Why don't you... What? What do you mean? It's not... It's not the 30th, 30th of the month. I... No, I can't change now. It's happening too soon. I... I'll be right back. Some say that if you travel out on the 30th of every month and you look up at the night sky, you might see an ominous moon. No, not like Majora's Mask Moon. No, you will see a moon that looks like a stupid guy taking a photo of himself through a toilet paper roll. Legend has it that if you gaze upon this stupid face for long enough, you'll transform into a nothing that is anywhere near human form. Nay, you will transform from a gorgeous, go gorgeous haired individual to someone who looks like they live in California and have a man bun. It's the great man bun moon and it's absolutely disgusting. Let's get on to our final chat segment. Man, I'm sure glad that didn't happen to me. We have Juan Christian, uh, Christiancho, Christiancho with the $25 donation. And uh, Juan says, Hey Kyle, love the show. I'm an associate professor born in Colombia, living in Texas. Have you heard about oh, Thorn's account? Uh, <laughs> you know I haven't, just uh, based on the way I'm reading it. Uh, Thorn Zykatau objects, also known as hybrid stars. If so, do you know if their existence has been confirmed? I have no idea what those are. So if you want to put a link to them in the chat, I will go back and I will look at them later. But you're still simping, and I still appreciate you, Juan. Master of all, as always, the 1294, um, with the Australian $10, it says, Hey Kyle, how's your new PC going so far with work use? Well, master of all, it's going fine. I haven't gotten my PC yet. Um... Uh, as some of the members of the facility pointed out, and some actually got an email from the company, and they're act one of the members of the facility works at the company that I'm buying from because nerds are everywhere, and I love it. So that specific nerd pointed out that if I, if I wanted to make my facility streaming experience even better, uh, they recommended some upgrades. So I believe we'll be doing some upgrades first before my PC actually gets here, and then I will have an absolute streaming machine, and then we might. Um, start doing more traditional streaming kind of, kind of things uh, like playing games and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but... Uh, uh, look, I'm sorry. We just got to get to our last topic because this is adorable. Is an adorable cat. In fact, this is my brand new kitten. This is um, the distinguished Lady 3 Jane Marie France Tessier Ashpool. If you know the reference, put it in the chat. But this is my, uh, this is my little darling, and she is an absolute menace, but she's also very, very sweet. I did a whole video on her, if you want to check it out. Uh, the Secret Science of Cat Claws, I believe it's called, or something like that, back on the channel. Um, and I made that because her claws are so sharp. I'm still, I still have a, I mean, like, I have a scar on my arm 
still from when I first got her. Anyway, why am I, why, why am I showing you this adorable little face? Well, uh, I started because, so this is, when science is really powerful, it can change behavior. Uh, in the most dire of examples, you know, showing that wearing masks really works against the pandemic, that can change behavior. Um, learning some new information can change your mind about something. And this is a fun example of that, where learning something about the psychology and biology of cats has literally changed my behavior. So what that science was, was a study, uh, which is the role of cat-eye narrowing movements in cat-human communication. Um, and this study has actually changed how I function with my cats. Yes, it does look weird, but between us, it's good. So anecdotally, many people have noticed over the years, over the decades, including myself before I read this, that, well, A, cats don't have eyelids, so they don't really need to blink in the same way that you and I need to blink to refresh rate our peepers. So cats don't really need to blink, and sometimes they initiate this, this kind of slow blink, this slow blink that um, seems almost affectionate in nature or very relaxed, like they're about to fall asleep or they're very comfortable, they're not alert, they seem very content. So many people have noticed this, noticed this anecdotally over the years, but is there any truth to this anecdata? Are, are the cats actually um, indicating something to humans? Because that would, uh, that would um, indicate some kind of evolved behavior of a semi-domesticated animal where a behavior co-evolved with humans, which would be really interesting, right? Well, this is the first study looking into the specific eye-narrowing, slow-blink behavior. And uh, from the discussion of this study, it says, quote, our results not only describe the specific mo movements involved in cat slow-blink sequences, but also produces several strands of evidence which collectively suggest that cats respond to a human giving a slow-blink stimulus by producing their own eye-narrowing stimulus. Okay. So now we have a study showing that if you slow blink at a cat, it more often than not, more often than chance, will slow blink back. Well, what does that mean? Well, first, cats deliver more air, eye narrowing movements when their owners slow blink at them than when, an, uh, than when the owner is present in the room but not delivering the stimulus. So that part of the study is meant to weed out randomness, right? So this is very important part of experimental work you have to isolate variables so if you are put in a room by by a, some scientist and they say blink at your cat and it blinks back you can't tell if it's actually blinking in response to you unless you try the uh to isolate that variable which is to say stare at your cat without blinking if it blinks the same amount the same frequency then your blinking has nothing to do with it but what they found is that cats blink more so when their owner blinks at them. Secondly, as a part of the study to prove this effect, when an unfamiliar experimenter, like the random scientist, gives a slow blink stimulus compared to adopting a neutral face, cats respond with a higher frequency of eye narrowing movements themselves. So this is still, um, still looking at a human face, even if it's not their owner's face, they still will blink more often than chance. In addition, quoting the study, this study produces evidence that cats perceive human slow blinking in a positive way, as subjects prefer to approach an experimenter after a slow blink interaction has occurred compared to when there is no uh, blinking contact with the cat. This is in accordance with previous anecdotal reports of this behavior signaling relaxation in cats. So what we're saying, so through these different lines of evidence, which seem redundant, but you have to do it to isolate variables, it does seem like a cat is more willing to be familiar and approach someone when interacting in this slow blink way. And so now what I do is, I don't know if you have a cat like this, but I have cats that, I have one cat that tends to stare a lot with her big dumb face. And so now, Whenever I catch her staring at me, or I'm staring at her, I will initiate a slow blink stimulus. 
Um, I haven't been doing it long enough to notice any real change in behavior, but this study has single-handedly changed the way I interact with my own pets, where now, you know, Aria will be somewhere else and she'll be like, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, and I'm just in a, <laughs> I'm staring at my cat in a corner like, I love you. I hope you know that I love you. So I'm trying to bond with my cats more by adopting a possibly co-evolved behavior that signals relaxation in cats that they understand. And there's, uh, cats aren't the only animals that have this kind of co-evolved behavior. Um, dogs have learned generally, generationally to, uh, like, like pointer dogs. They can point at stuff. They can recognize what pointing means if you point at stuff. Um, so it's not just cats, but the fact that cats do this, uh, an animal that is notoriously very standoffish and very um, solitary and only semi-domesticated for a cat to do this, I think to prove that or semi-prove that is very interesting. And now if you have cats, I suggest that you go ahead and blink at your cats all the time. Let's make it weird. The Zero Thousand says, my cats do this. And uh, Malarkey Hippie says, cats are much more like orcas in how they approach, in how to approach them and the signals they send back. Orcas are the scariest animals in the ocean. It goes orcas, then great white sharks, then leopard seals, then bull sharks. That's my top four. Uh, Livi Livia's Gameplay says, and we have about three or four more minutes for questions. If you have them, the cats speak to me. They blink in tongues. I don't, I don't think that's true. Uh, Alter, Alto Eager says, couldn't this be a feature of cat-to-cat -cat evolution, though? Stares equals challenge, aggression, slow blinks equals chill. Sure, but the fact, it, it could be a, a behavior in cats specifically because they don't usually meow at themselves. Even meowing is, they don't meow at each other to speak. They only meow at humans. It's also an evolved behavior like, give me food or whatever, or, give me pets. Um, but the fact that a cat will blink back at a human as opposed to another cat and as opposed to a blank human face, that indicates that it does recognize that the human is doing that kind of behavior. I, I'm assuming a, a cat knows the difference between a cat and a human. Uh, we have $50 from Olivia Yates, who says... Near where I grew up, uh, PGE tried building a nuclear power plant in the 60s and the locals weren't having it. The project halted during early construction. The site was on a peninsula on an estuary right next to an earthquake fault. Well, yeah. There's dangers involved with every construction. and I, But as we'll go through, you, you will be surprised how safe nuclear energy is. And I understand public sentiment around it. But I say this sentiment is psychological bias. Um, and I get that there's uh, what uh, politicians call NIMBY. Not in my backyard. No one wants a nuclear power plant in their backyard. I personally do, because I think the cooling towers look awesome. Um, so I get no one wants it in their own backyard. But as I will present, there's a... Not only is there a climate change argument, I believe there is a moral argument argument to adopting more nuclear power everywhere right now. And if I have piqued your interest, ooh, just stay tuned. Aurealis with a 10 says, how are you doing today? Hey, thanks. Actually, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, what is the possibility of humans inventing short, possibly mobile quantum tunnel machinery? What about light hard light holograms can we contain can we create and contain black holes that's a lot of questions i'm gonna go with the second one um i've never understood hard light but what i really like um there's a uh technology or at least one lab did it but they call it voxels and what they're doing is using lasers to create plasma in three-dimensional uh, arrays so you can imagine uh, a bunch of lasers all focusing in on a bunch of dots in three dimensions in air. It's kind of like, have you seen those uh, those in those bubble sculpture, those bubble designs encased in glass? It's kind of like that. 
But if these lasers can focus down on different points in the air f so fast that it creates plasma, and so fast that it creates what our eyes perceive as some kind of shape, um, because it's plasma, you can actually touch it and feel it. And these voxels, these visual pixels, I think they call them, um, it's kind of like hard light in air. It's like a hologram you can actually touch because it's made of laser plasma, which I think is awesome. Um, Music Central Piano coming in, and let's stop the Super Chats because we have a banger coming in. Music Central Piano with the 5115. As always, Music Central, keep up the great work, Kyle. Great topics. Stay rational and safe. Also, does your cat have higher security cat clearance than Kevin? Kevin will need to get it together. He can no longer use 2020 as an excuse for his lack of plaques. Maybe 2021 is the year we get our plaques together. Who's to say? But yes, my no, my cats don't have higher security clearance than all my Kevins. What they have, they're wily. And they get in through, like, corridors and vents. You ever seen Alien? It's kind of like that. Dr. Strange Joe, one of my Professor Emeritus at the facility, with a $100 donation, no question, just want to use some of my Christmas bonus to simp for science. I very, very much appreciate that. Looking forward to what this year brings for the facility. Well, Dr. Strange Joe, you are in luck because I will hopefully be doing a lot of interesting stuff as we kick off the second year of the facility. Thank you so much for joining me this week. I know I've been off for a couple weeks, but my streaming system was in the shop and it's about to be upgraded. So in the next few weeks, it's going to get even better in here and I hope you join me. But if you want to continue this conversation after the show, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill right now. At a certain tier, you get into our Discord. You can talk with me, ask me questions basically 24-7. I mostly lurk, but you can also get episodes early as my Patreons will get this week early. You can get behind-the-scenes photos, um, uh, members-only live streams. Not like that. But that's patreon.com slash Kyle Hill as my security team is putting in the chat. We went through so much cool stuff today. If you want to go back and you're not you're catching this live and you didn't catch the whole thing, it will be up on the YouTube channel shortly after this video publishes. Um, tomorrow, I will be on an hour long, about an hour and a half long podcast video with my favorite bedroom artist. I like that. My bedroom favorite bedroom singer, Sue Lee, S-U-L-E-E. -E. If you haven't checked her out, you should check her out. I love her music. I'll be putting an hour and a half long podcast with her up that Talks through basically my whole life, my whole outlook on things, and uh, hers as well. Stay tuned for that. And also, I don't know if this is about to be streamed, but if you also like Magic the Gathering and competitive Magic the Gathering, I will be streaming and or appearing on a video on the Play to Win channel very, very shortly. In fact, I'm going to play them in about 30 minutes. So wish me luck. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Let's make 2020 the year that we dig ourselves out of this hole, we, we're going to make ourselves the best versions of ourselves that we can possibly be. We're going to be diligent. We're going to be passionate. We're going to be compassionate. Let's do it together. Till the next time that I see you, be nice to each other. Because until we have quantum internet, this slow version of interaction is all we got.